Okay, um, we're going to get started. We know that people are still joining. Uh, welcome to Emotions Matter webinar on mindfulness and BPD featuring Amanda Smith. Uh, my name is Paula Tusiani Eng, and I'm the Executive Director of Emotions Matter. Whether you're joining us for the first time or you've accessed one of our programs, resources, or events before, we welcome you to our community. Emotions Matter is a 501c3 peer-run, family-run nonprofit organization founded in 2015. Our mission is to support, educate, and advocate for borderline personality disorder. We do this by offering programs, educational initiatives to support those impacted by BPD. And our vision is to create a world in which every individual impacted by BPD has access to resources, support, and healthcare to achieve a meaningful recovery. To learn more about us, you can access our website at www.emotionsmatterbpd.org. Before we begin, we just have a few organizational notes and disclaimers. Um, first, during the presentation tonight, you may hear about the word recovery and BPD. Um, at Emotions Matter, we know that the notion of recovery is uniquely defined by each individual's experience of BPD. Every person is different with varying symptoms, thoughts, and life experiences. Therefore, when we use the word recovery, we use it broadly to define, we define recovery as being on the journey toward healing. And we use this language so that no matter where you are or your loved one is on their journey, we can offer hope for recovery. Also, this is an educational webinar about BPD and mindfulness. We hope you'll find it informational and helpful. But if you should become upset by anything mentioned during this webinar, we encourage you to consult your support system or professional. Um, this is our first webinar in Emotions Matter. While we've used Zoom extensively for our groups and meetings, we ask your patience in case there's any technical difficulties. We're all in this together, literally, and learning to master new technology. During this webinar, at the end, there, throughout the webinar, there will be a Q&A chat box for you to post questions that you may have for Amanda. Um, myself and another volunteer from Emotions Matter, Rivka, will be monitoring the questions. And when Amanda is finished with her presentation, we will moderate by asking the questions that you put in the chat box to her. Um, depending on time, we'll do our best to make sure that folks' questions get answered. Um, and it will really depend on the time that we have. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Amanda Smith. Amanda started off her career in mental health serving as the executive director of the Pinellas County, Florida affiliate of the National Alliance for Mental Illness, NAMI, in Florida. In 2007, she founded the Florida Borderline Personality Disorder Association, a nonprofit organization dedicated toward providing advocacy, education, and support for persons diagnosed with EPD and their families. She received her master's in social work from Baylor University and is trained in dialectical behavior therapy from the Lenahan Institute. She moved to Waco, Texas and founded a practice called Hope for BPD, where she works as a therapist and is a consultant to support those diagnosed with BPD and their families. She writes a blog called My Dialectical Life. Amanda Smith is also an author of the Dialectical Behavioral Therapy Wellness Planner, 365 Days of Healthy Living for Your Body, Mind, and Spirit as part of the Borderline Personality Disorder Wellness Series. And she's also the author of the Borderline Personality Disorder Wellness Planner for Families. Now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Amanda Smith. Thank you so much. Okay, let's... Hi everyone, <laughs> and all right, can you see the PowerPoint presentation? I just want to be certain that it is sharing and on and that we're ready to go. Paula? Yes, I can see it. Okay, excellent, thank you. I did it correctly then, thank you so much. All right, so over the next um, 30, 40 minutes, we're gonna be talking about 
mindfulness, the power of mindfulness. And when I think about mindfulness, I think about this very practical application of mindfulness. So we'll also um, begin to define that and talk about what that looks like. So, however, I want to start out by, let's see if I can, if I can, no, for whatever reason, I'm not able to move forward on my PowerPoint presentation. And I'm wondering what that's about since there it goes. Okay, all right, thank you so much for being patient with me. So just as a reminder, I want for you, again, over the next 30, 40 minutes to be taking what works. Um, not everything I suggest or may come up over the next, um, the t during the time we're together is going to necessarily be beneficial for you or will be a good fit. And I want for you to remember that that is something that is perfectly okay. So please, please feel free to take whatever works for you and leave the rest behind. So let's start out by defining mindfulness. So I love this definition by John Kabat-Zinn, and then I have another definition from Marsha Linehan. And author and researcher John Kabat-Zinn has spent most of his professional career um, leading mindfulness groups, uh, researching mindfulness, um, educating the public, about mindfulness. He's one of my big heroes when it comes to mindfulness. And he defines mindfulness in a pretty simple and straightforward way. So he says mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment and non-judgmentally. So if you are someone who is familiar with DBT, this probably also sounds like what we hear in DBT all the time. And it's a nice reminder to me that mindfulness is really the opposite of being on autopilot. It's more about responding with awareness rather than being that person who's at any given moment is reacting to whatever is happening around them or in their environment. I don't know about you, but when I think about my own journey in learning mindfulness, in the beginning, at any given moment, I was kind of on that hamster wheel of reacting. Whatever was happening, either in my life or in my mind, or whatever was happening, even I think in my family, with family interactions, I pretty much almost always responded with that reaction. And often it was kind of an impulsive reaction. And there wasn't a whole lot of awareness when it came to um, how I responded or how I interacted with the people I cared about the most. So for me, when I started learning about mindfulness, this was a pretty big aha moment in my life. For the longest time, I didn't even imagine that I could be um, responding to what was ever happening in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment. And again, another big aha moment was the idea that I didn't have to judge the moment. I didn't have to judge myself in the moment. I certainly didn't have to judge other people in the moment. And then I learned I didn't even have to really judge events that happened in the world. That that was all things, those were all things that were actually pretty optional. Um, and I didn't have to get carried away with whatever was happening or, and I certainly didn't have to get carried away with the story um, that was going on inside my head. So Marsha Linehan also has a pretty similar definition of mindfulness. Um, and she says that mindfulness is intentionally living with awareness in the present moment. So think about this moment right here, right now. This moment. And for most of us, we're either kind of in the past, we're thinking about what happened earlier today, or we're thinking about what happened last night, 
sometimes we're, we're way, way, way in the past and we're thinking about something that happened maybe five years ago or 10 years ago. We're really, really in the past and then that makes it harder to be in the present moment. Or maybe we're the person who isn't in the present moment, but we're thinking about what we're gonna have for dinner later tonight. Or perhaps we are thinking about um, something that's going to happen tomorrow or something that's going to happen next week or next month. So it's a nice reminder thinking about that awareness in the present moment and recognizing those times when we may not be in the present moment. Maybe we're, we're actually in the past or maybe we're that person and we're thinking about all the things that we need to get done before next Saturday or next Monday. Marsha Linehan also says that mindfulness is, again, without judgment or even rejecting the moment. So I can think of all of the times I know that I do this. Even though I'm a DBT therapist, sometimes I want to reject the moment. Sometimes I actually do reject the moment. I think this is too tough or this is too challenging. Or sometimes I get still stuck on thinking, I don't like this moment. I don't want this moment to be the way it is. So this one continues to be a little bit of a challenge for me, thinking about, okay, how can I practice that mindful awareness? And I cannot just be fully present in the moment, but I can really be embracing it. Even in those moments, when I don't necessarily like the moment. I don't actually am enjoying what's happening or enjoying what's going on. Because there are lots of those moments in all of our lives. And then the final thing she says is mindfulness is without that attachment to the present moment. So have you ever done this? So you didn't like the present moment, maybe you had an urge to reject the present moment, but then you started to stay attached to the present moment. You had a hard time letting go of the present moment. Um, again, let's say you were worried about something. You know, you weren't in the present moment, you were in the future, and then you had that attachment. You couldn't let go of that worry. Marsha Linehan says mindfulness is actually the exact opposite of doing that. So we want to be thinking again about, okay, what, what, it, what are our patterns or our habits that we bring to everyday life? And then we can think about the role of mindfulness in helping us to get that detachment so that we can be working toward, um, Marsha Linehan will say, having a life worth living. We can be our best selves. I can be my best Amanda. Um, in that present moment. So those are some of the things that we're thinking about when we are just beginning to define mindfulness. So one of the things that I love about mindfulness is that it's actually pretty practical. For the longest time, I think mindfulness had a reputation as being impractical, as being something that, um, you know, only certain people did, and you had to be a certain kind of person before you even started. Um, I think about people who are naturally mindful. Um, I am not that person. I have to work really, really hard at being mindful every single day. Um, and I think about, again, the benefits of this very practical application of everyday mindfulness. And the good news is that we have a lot of strong um, evidence that really suggests that mindfulness practice, consistent mindfulness practice, can really help us to be less impulsive. It can also help us to reduce fear and anxiety. We also have a lot of really good evidence um, that points to the success of mindfulness in treating and even preventing depression. We can also think about how, um, I think about the symptoms of ADHD. 
can often be managed with consistent mindfulness practice. Again, this is something that is really, really good news. And then, of course, we want to be thinking about how mindfulness can help us stay in control of our minds. So again, I think about that tendency that a lot of us have, most of us probably have, when we want to, we have, again, that urge to reject that moment, to push away um, a moment of sadness or a moment of fear or anxiety. But then I said that the, the, the difficult part, the challenging part, is that we actually, when we're trying to push it away, sometimes we even get more attached to that moment. So mindfulness helps us to stay in control of what's happening in our minds rather than our minds controlling what's happening next. Controlling our behaviors, controlling how um, we think about ourselves or we think about others. Mindfulness can help us to do all of these different things that are so beneficial and so helpful for us. So, we can think about that practice of mindfulness in a couple of different ways. So, I think about the formal practice of mindfulness. We might think about how um, someone might have a meditation practice, or I think about the practice of yoga. Um, so you're going to a place or you're sitting in a particular position for a particular amount of time and um, there's a particular goal for the meditation or for the yoga. That's a, that's a kind of mindfulness practice. And then I think about the informal practice of mindfulness. And this is something that is really more emphasized in DBT. So we can think about examples such as um, these little bits of mindfulness here and there in all of our lives. So we can think about how we can practice mindfulness when it comes to doing something as simple as brushing our teeth or having a meal or driving our cars or maybe we can practice mindfulness if we're sitting on the bus. So we can have these little moments of mindfulness here and there throughout our days. Those are very practical applications. I can think about how self-compassion is also an important part of mindfulness. It's almost impossible to be self-compassionate unless we're mindful. They really do go hand in hand. We can think about having mindful conversations with people we care about. Sometimes, again, because I'm a work in progress and these skills are skills I need to work on every single day. Every once in a while, my husband will start talking to me and in the middle of the conversation, I don't know if you've ever done this, but I certainly have. In the middle of a conversation, I will pick up my phone and look at a call or a text or look at Instagram. And that, again, it's the exact opposite of having a mindful conversation. It's something that is really pretty mindless. So again, we can think about that, that application of being connected to the people we care about the most. How do we have mindful conversations? where again, we're fully present in the present moment and we are present without that judgment toward ourselves or toward someone else. We can also think about with mindfulness how we can allow ourselves to experience our emotion or just the idea of, you know, we can be that person who's aware of our breath. Just the very simple act of breathing in and out and in and out is something that, again, the, the benefits spill out into so many areas of our lives. 
sometimes when I am talking to people about mindfulness or I'm teaching some of these skills in our DBT group, sometimes it seems so deceptively simple. Like, oh, okay, right, I get it. I can be aware of my breath. And yet there's something really important happening in our bodies and in our minds when we're being aware of our breath. When we're pausing long enough, even if it's 30 seconds or 60 seconds or 90 seconds, we're pausing, we're slowing things down, we're allowing ourselves to really, really become aware of our breath. Again, it seems so simple. We think this has to be fancy or it has to be um, extra challenging. Um, and with mindfulness, sometimes the, um, the simplest ideas can be the most powerful when it comes to helping ourselves to feel just a little bit better. So here is our first practice for today. So this is mindfulness of gratitude. And if you are comfortable following along, then I would love for you to give this a try. Again, I want to emphasize if this feels like, no, I, I am not willing to do this today, or this is not something I want to, I want to listen, but I'm not going to participate. Um, I want to tell you that's 100% okay. Um, but this is the first practice. So we can do this with our eyes open or we can close our eyes for this exercise. I want you to do whatever is most comfortable to you. So the first step is allowing yourself to become very quiet for a moment. So again, I know in webinars, sometimes I'm that person, I'm checking my phone or I'm looking out the window or I'm doing all of these things and I'm not necessarily getting quiet in that moment. So you, wherever you are in the world, you can think about what, does, what, do, what do you need to do right now in order to become very quiet for a few moments. I also want you to be thinking about being in a comfortable position. What would that feel like for you right now? Sometimes we talk about putting our feet flat on the floor, or maybe we have an open body position so we don't have our arms crossed in front of us. And then next, I want you to focus on taking some deep breaths. Again, I don't necessarily want you to count your breaths or to do anything that at all feels unnatural. Do what feels most comfortable to you. All right, so now we're going to take a couple of minutes and I am going to time us. I want you to take two minutes to be mindful of someone you are grateful for. So I want you to think about this person and how they have helped you. Over those two minutes, I want you to be thinking about the person, how they've helped you, and if you can, notice what it feels like to experience that gratitude or thankfulness in your mind, in your body. Okay, all right, so we are gonna start now and go for two minutes. Okay, go ahead.
We'll go for a few more seconds. Keep taking those deep breaths. Stay as quiet as you can. And if your eyes are closed, you can begin to open them. You can start to look around the room. You can kind of just notice what that experience was like for you. You can observe and describe. These are great mindfulness skills to use from DBT. You know, what was it, what was that exercise like for you? What did you experience? How did you feel? What were you thinking during the exercise? One of the things that I love about this exercise is that we can do it with the people in our lives we care about the most. So we can do it with a partner. We can do this exercise with a family member. We can do this with a friend. And then it's kind of nice to share afterwards. We can share what we experienced or we can share the person we were thinking about. And then we can take turns talking about that experience. And sometimes that's a way for people to, um, to feel gratitude. But then also it's, it's a moment where we connect with people we care about and share special moments. It's also something that can be pretty self-validating. When we think about the people who care about us, we can think about the people we care about is something that is almost always something very relaxing and also something very soothing. So here is the next exercise we have. So for this exercise, you will want to keep your eyes open. So this is about external observation or external observing. So again, you'll want to allow yourself to become very quiet. You'll want to be in that comfortable position again. And right now, begin to focus on taking some deep breaths. Do whatever feels most comfortable for you. All right, so whatever room you're in, I want you to find one object. Not many, not two, just one object or person. Um, it can be an animal, it can be a pet. And I want you to mindfully observe that object, person, or animal for two minutes. So we can think about how you might observe sounds or shapes or colors or other attributes. So earlier today, I was practicing this exercise and my cat was in the room. So for two minutes, I observed her breathing. So she was taking a nap, so I was observing her breath as she was breathing. So we can also, for some advanced practice, I think this is a very challenging. Um, See if you can try not to observe, describe what you are observing. So Marshall Linehan calls this wordless watching, where we're watching or we're observing, but there's not that ongoing narrative inside of our heads. So we can think about observing as one skill and then describing as a separate skill. If you find yourself during these couple of minutes that you are describing what you are observing, you can make a decision to not judge yourself. You can make a decision to go right back to observing. Um, and you can, you can let it go. All right, so um, find something in the room you're in. And we're, again, going to go about two minutes with those observ with just that mindful observation. Okay, so start when you're ready.
All right, and when you're ready, you can kind of just start noticing things around the room you're in. You can notice different things. You can stop focusing on that one particular object or person or animal. This is an interesting challenge. I remember the first time I did this, um, I started to observe something. Um, and then just in moments, I started to describe it. And I realized, wow, this is such an automatic response. When things are happening either with us or in our environment. And at any given moment, again, we've got that ongoing narrative. And sometimes it doesn't interfere with our ability to manage our emotions or to um, complete a particular goal. And then sometimes it does. If I am speaking with someone and um, let's say, you know, something's happening in the conversation and I start to worry or have a little anxiety, um, in that moment I can, I can, that narrative will start. So I'm no longer focusing on what the person is saying. But again, though that description starts up and I'm thinking, oh, well, this is happening or that's happening or, or this must be what the person is thinking right now, even though I don't know what that is. I don't, I don't even know that that's happening, but that's where sometimes my mind goes. So um, I wanna recognize one more time, this is, this is pretty challenging, I think, for a lot of people. Most of the time, again, we have that narrative in our head about what's going on. We have that story, or we're making assumptions, or we're either judging ourselves, or we're judging the other person. It's really common to do all of those. And here is our third and final um, mindfulness application for today. And you'll notice, I see I'm making a mindful observation um, that for this slide I did not write practice three, um, that that was something that I didn't change. So again, this is, this is a great, um, again, way to practice mindfulness. I can right now have um, some judgment. Oh, I should have given my husband these slides so that he could um, review them and, and find my errors. Um, or I can practice mindfulness and I can just let it go. That's all I need to do is let it go. Boy, these, uh, these skills apply to every area of our lives. Okay, all right, so this is um, our last one for today. So this is internal observation. So your, for this exercise, your eyes can be open or closed. Um, again, allow yourself to be in a comfortable position. Um, get as quiet as you can. And start taking some of those deep breaths where you're feeling just a little more relaxed. And then this time I want you to find something inside yourself to observe. So you might be observing some thoughts or some emotions or urges. You might be observing your breath. You might be observing some body sensations. Let's say you haven't eaten in four, six, eight hours. You might be observing a sensation of um, hunger or even pain. So find something that you can mindfully observe for another couple of minutes. See if you can also be a little curious about whatever it is you are describing. So for this example, you're not just observing, but you're also describing. So maybe you're observing and describing your breath. Or maybe you're observing and describing an urge to check your phone. Or maybe you are observing and describing some thoughts you have. Okay, all right, so let's start um, your final couple of minutes now.
And when you're ready, you can begin to open your eyes if they were closed. You, can, you may decide to give in to that urge to check your phone or to do something else for a moment or two. Excellent. So again, we can think about the things that we can observe in our environment or things that are happening with other people. And then we can think about that internal observation where we're observing what's happening with us. For some people, it's easier to observe external things, and it's a little bit harder to observe things that are internal. Um, if that sounds like you, then you have maybe some potential room to practice. Um, you know, what would it look like to spend 30 seconds later tonight observing an emotion or observing a thought or observing your breath? especially if that's something that doesn't come as easily to you. Oh, and there it is. There it is. Okay. All right. So we had, we had an extra one here. So, all right. So more practice. Okay, here are a few more ideas I would love for you to consider. So um, I love the idea. I don't know if anyone here has ever done this. I absolutely love the idea of blowing bubbles mindfully with a wand as a way to practice mindful breathing. It's one of my favorite things to do. Really one of my favorite things to do. We can also think about how we want to listen to a favorite song mindfully. So we can think maybe an average song is three, maybe four minutes. Um, and all we want to do during those three or four minutes is just listen. We're not going to do anything else. And then again, we can think about that practical application of mindfulness with everyday activities showering, eating, driving, again, maybe sitting on the bus, brushing our teeth, walking, um, pouring coffee um, can be a way for us to mindfully interact um, with the things around us, with the people around us. So for most of us, mindful, mindfulness practice is really challenging. Um, the more we practice, the easier it gets and the more benefits we see in our lives. Um, if you have not yet established any kind of a mindfulness practice, I want for you to imagine that it's okay to start out with 60 or 90 seconds of mindfulness a few times a day. And then when you're ready, challenge yourself to two, three, or maybe five minutes of mindful activity three or four times a day. Um, we know, again, all of this wonderful research. Um, all of all this takes is a few mindful minutes that we set aside each and every day. We don't need to be that person who has a formal medica meditation practice for um, an hour at a time. That's not something, um, not that we won't benefit from that, but that's not something um, that we really need to aim for when it comes to mindfulness. So some books I love, um, Full Catastrophe Living by John Kabat-Zinn, um, The Mindfulness Solution for Intense Emotions, Take Control of BPD with DBT by Cedar Coons is a book I love. Um, Mindfulness for BPD by Blaze Geary is really terrific as well. Um, and I also like Bob Stahl's book. Um, it's called The Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Workshop workbook and it has a lot of great great ideas for mindfulness um, for some apps um, calm and insight timer are apps that are very popular um, i have both of them on my phone and use them pretty frequently um, and then there's kristen neff's site on self-compassion she has a lot of great audio meditations at her site um, and then I think about YouTube has so many. Um, all you need to do is type in mindfulness meditation on YouTube um, and you've got thousands and thousands of options 
for um, guided meditations, um, ways of practicing mindfulness. So you can find me at Hope for BPD and MyDialecticalLife.com. And I think that's it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, I felt even listening to you speak was very calming. And at this time, um, I would like to invite those that are listening to please post any questions for Amanda in the chat box. And we will ask those questions. There's a Q&A prompt at the bottom if you'd like to ask questions there. Um, and Rivka, would you like to start with some questions also? Yes, I'm going to ask a question. And this is actually um, kind of more than one question in one. It's, um, what do you suggest for someone who knows and understands the purpose of mindfulness when faced with difficult and stressful situations, but can't seem to push themselves to actually put it all into practice? What if they are more willful when it comes to actually getting themselves out of distressing times? How do you combat willfulness and promote willingness? What a great question. So I, I think my first thought is um, just that awareness of those moments where a little more willful and we're a little more stubborn, um, I think it is like just a great first step. Um, I remember years ago, I was, um, when I was first learning these skills, one of the things that I noticed was that I really needed a lot of extra help with, um, with the mindfulness skills and again, that practical application. So one of the things I did was for, I, I did this for 30 days. I made a big poster board um, that I decorated with markers and stickers and I gave myself a challenge that I was going to practice mindfulness twice a day for 30 days. Um, that I think was one of the big turning points um, again, when I was learning DBT and I was really, really working hard to integrate these skills was just to think, okay, if I'm, if I'm going to do this, then I really need to do this. I can't, um, be that person and says, well, I'll use the skills only when, um, I'm in the middle of an argument or I'll only use the skills when things are really breaking down. Um, so for me, that was something that was really beneficial, and I think it really helped me to, um, I don't want to say there's no willfulness ever, but to really reduce that significantly um, is something that was very beneficial for me. Just kind of making it a priority and saying, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do this no matter what. Um, I'm going to make this a practice every single day, no matter what. Um, and again, it made a difference. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, just as a follow-up to, I guess, those questions, how do you combat distraction in your mindfulness practice? I think that um, distraction is going to happen no matter where we are or what we're doing. Um, I think it's um, exceptionally rare for people not to become distracted during mindfulness practice. Um, it's, it's interesting for me to think um, about those urges that all of us experience. So let's say we are feeling distracted during mindfulness practice. We have an urge to check our phones or to get up and walk around the room or to say, I'll do this later when it's easier. Um, and again, I think that I think there's something to knowing, okay, I'm going to do this for two minutes or five minutes or 10 minutes, whatever it is. And to even go in with the ex expectation that this is going to be hard, or there are going to be moments where it could be hard. And um, I'm probably going to get distracted. And it's actually pretty normal to be distracted. So I think that's um, an important part of it is just to realize that's normal. Um, it's definitely part of mindfulness. And we don't have to give in to that urge to be distracted. 
we can still stay mindfully present. Thanks, Amanda. Here's another question um, from the Q&A box. Um, is being absorbed in a task without being aware of that the same as being mindful? You know, I, I would say no. And I want to be open to the possibility that someone may have a different opinion. I think that when we are, I think that being absorbed in a task, um, Marsha Linehan might refer to that as being um, um, mindfully participating. We're kind of just throwing ourselves into an activity. Um, or, or sometimes we refer to it as flow. Like we're right in the middle of something, we're enjoying it so much um, that it's almost hard to distract us because we're so focused, we're hyper-focused. Um, which I think can be a lot of the time really wonderful and terrific and even fun. Um, but if we don't have that awareness of what's going on, so let's say I, I'm doing a jigsaw puzzle and I'm beginning to lose track of time because I'm having such an enjoyable time or because I'm so focused on the task, so focused on completing this piece or that piece of the puzzle. We can argue, absolutely, that's a way to practice mindfulness. If my husband comes in the room and says, hey, Amanda, um, you know, what? maybe it's, it's 1 a.m., maybe we should go to bed, um, then that, that points to um, something that is probably less mindful um, and maybe something that, um, again, I worry about that lack of awareness um, when we're ab just kind of absorbed with something. Um, I think sometimes for some people, um, that can be awfully close to um, dissociation. Um, so again, if we're, if we're mindfully present in the moment, um, that's it's much less likely to happen. Thank you so much for that answer. That was very informative. Um, another question we got, um, actually it's a comment, then a question. Um, this viewer was intrigued to learn that self-compassion is a form of mindfulness. What a gem of wisdom. Can you elaborate on why and how that is? I think, mine, I, I think about how mindfulness and self-compassion really go hand in hand. Um, one of the cornerstones of self-compassion practice is being non-judgmental again, toward ourselves, toward others, um, even events in the world. So I think, again, it goes hand in hand with mindfulness. I think that we really, it's hard to have one without the other. Um, and it's just a way of practicing um, mindfulness that I think resonates with a lot of people who are, um, have a harder time being compassionate toward themselves, um, so I, I think it's, it's just an interesting take for most people, I think, on, on being mindful. It's something I think that resonates with a lot of people, this idea of, oh, I'm, I'm practicing mindfulness, but at the same um, moment I'm practicing a mindfulness skill, I can also be very kind to myself. Or in this moment, I can be um, compassionate toward myself. Or I can, in this moment, I can be giving myself a break. Um, and I don't need to be, you know, focusing on the shoulds or the shouldn'ts or the musts or anything like that. So that's, that's the way I think they go hand in hand. That's awesome. Um, there's actually a bunch of requests for a list of, you know, the apps and more apps for mindfulness. And, uh -huh. I, think, and I think just as a general thing, what we're going to do is send a follow-up email with a list of those apps instead okay, of great. saying them out now. Um, and someone just gave a suggestion for everyone who's listening um, of a thing, you know, another mindfulness exercise called find your happy place. You know, think of a place you'd like to be now. Describe what's around you. Smell like what do you smell? What do you see? What do you feel? Um, and use all I your- I love it. I love it. Yes. Question from someone. Um, 
Paula, do you have anything to ask? Um, another, another, um, another viewer made a comment about positive intelligence. Um, the work of, I'm not pronouncing it right, but Shazrad Shamin. Um, and also it's an app that is, has mindfulness uh, practices. So oh, we, can, okay. All right. we, can, we could share that as well. Okay. Um, okay. So we are, um, let's see, we are almost at the end of our time. What we will do, because of, there's been a number of questions about the website, is we will follow up, as Rivka said, um, I hope, Amanda, you'll be able to share your slides with us and we will be able to um, at least share the resources uh, with folks that are registered, we can send it out via email. Um, and let's see, yes, we will. I see people saying, please send a list of the books that she mentioned. And also, uh, can you please send a list of the websites? So we will do that, absolutely. Okay. Um, I wanna thank, um, I don't know if, let's see, I can turn my camera on. Um, on behalf of Emotions Matter, I want to thank Amanda Smith for giving up her time um, to provide us with this informational webinar from Waco, Texas. We are very grateful. Um, I also want to thank Rivka, our volunteer, for helping with IT support this afternoon. It takes a village of volunteers and we could not do it without our volunteers. And I will thank you all for attending. Um, we do ask after the webinar this afternoon, um, you will receive a survey, um, and in light of, you know, the global health pandemic, we're doing our best to explore different virtual formats for our programming, so we'd appreciate um, the feedback. We'll also send it in a follow-up email if you can just answer questions so that we get your feedback about what types of topics to answer in the future. We would greatly appreciate it. And also, um, May is BPD Awareness Month, and we have lots of exciting activities coming up this month. Um, on Wednesday evening, we'll be co-sponsoring with the NEA BPD, a webinar on perspectives on BPD and recovery. That's on Wednesday evening at 7.30. Um, we will be hosting a wellness workshop uh, on writing and the role of writing in BPD recovery. One of our board members, who's a writer and a teacher, Emma Ramos um, in recovery will talk about the role of writing in her recovery and do a writing workshop where people can share their writing and talk about their experiences of writing in recovery. Um, we'll be doing a webinar later in the month with Dr. Sarah Maslin, who writes in the area of stigma in BPD and understanding how stigma affects BPD on May 20th, one o'clock. We'll be doing a virtual art night on May 27th, where everyone will be able to um, make art and share art, especially art that can be shared for our virtual walk for BPD um, on May 31st, where we will have speakers live and sharing messages of hope and advocating for recovery. So check out our website, follow us on social media. Um, and if you have any questions, of course, we are here for you. Feel free to reach out to us via email or phone. And again, thank you, Amanda. And we hope everybody has a safe and healthy evening and rest of the month. Take care now. Let's see, I'm just waiting for everyone to get out. Oh.